Welcome to Math 31. This is a continuation of the lesson on curve sketching or sketching functions. So I'm going to just graph a couple more. It's not a small thing because these are all long questions. And these two graphs we'll look at right now are similar. The method is very similar to what we've been doing previously, but the graphs themselves look a little bit different. So you'll get a few different looks at different uh, things that you can encounter f of x is equal to x to the 5 thirds minus x to the 2 thirds. And um, the question doesn't really say, but I'm going to take this one just for t making our life a little bit easier. Let's take this one. And this is a common sort of instruction. So round to nearest tenth, where appropriate. So if we get some really, really hard to work with numbers, I'm going to round them off. Now always get in the habit of checking your domain and in this case because it's the cube root again there is no restriction on the domain so it's going to be all real numbers negative infinity to positive infinity. So Always watch out for that and then look for some of the other things that are happening. And the intercepts is an interesting one algebraically. First off, the y-intercept, when we set x equal to 0, we'll get f at 0 is equal to 0 to the 5 over 3 minus 0 to the 2 over 3. So this is just 0 minus 0. So f at 0 is equal to 0. Then our x-intercept, or intercepts, 0 is equal to x to the 5 over 3 minus x to the 2 over 3. Now the best way to solve this one, in my opinion, is to factor out the greatest common factor of those two terms. That's 5 over 3 if you can read that. So you're taking out a factor of x to the 2 over 3. And then when you carefully divide by that factor, remember that you subtract the exponents. And subtracting the exponents of 2 over 3 will leave you with x to the 3 over 3, or 1. And then x to the 2 thirds divided by x to the 2 thirds is just equal to 1. So we get an easy expression to deal with because of this. When we set each of those factors to 0, 0 is equal to x to the 2 thirds, and then 0 is equal to x minus 1, we then get x equal 1, x is equal to 0. So those are our two x-intercepts. As for asymptotes, Well, um, if we want to get asymptotes with this one, we first off, I suppose, look for a vertical asymptote. And a vertical asymptote could be found um, by looking for any inadmissible values, particularly in the denominator. And there are none, because there is no denominator with this one, so there is no vertical asymptote. And then as far as a horizontal asymptote goes, if we were to take the limit as x increases or decreases without bound, well, you're taking the cube root of the x. And once again, we really only need to pay attention to the leading term. That's going to dictate what's going on. We take the cube root of a number and then raise it to the fifth. Um, as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, then the y value is also going to correspondingly increase. And then the same thing is true, in fact, as x decreases. You take the cube root of it and then raise it to the five. It'll still be negative, but it will go on forever. So in fact, there is no limit, and therefore, no horizontal asymptote.
Now, let's take a look for symmetries, the least important of all of the measures. So we replace x with negative x. So f at negative x is equal to negative x to the 5 thirds minus negative x to the 2 thirds. And that seems fine, and it may be fine, but it's hard to make sense of it when it's in exponential form. So if it helped, take this and write this as negative x, the cube root raised to the 5, and then minus the cube root of negative x squared. And then try to see what's going on with it. Now remember that if we, if we are taken right back to the original expression, then it will be even. And in this case we can see that that's not going to be the case because if you do take the the cube root of negative x is a negative number and then raise it to the 5 it still is negative so this one in fact the negative could be taken out so it would be the cube root of x to the 5 and then this one here if we take the cube root out of this or take the negative, take the cube root of the negative, excuse me, is a negative, and then square it, it becomes positive. So what we end up getting then is this, and that's the problem. Because now, if we take out a factor of negative 1 from both of them, we use this to decide whether it's identical to the previous one, and it's not quite. So f at negative x is not equal to f at x, nor is it equal to negative f at x. So, and therefore, no symmetries. Had this sign been negative, after we removed that factor of negative 1, then it would have been an odd function, but it was not the case. So really what it came down to is the fact that we have that exponent of 2. Um, for the x. So we've expended a fair bit of energy already in getting this far and we actually don't have much to show for it, just a few x-intercepts. But when we do the first derivative analysis then I think we can actually get some place with this. So let's do that. Oops, a little quick on the draw there. There we go. So f at x just to write the function out again, is equal to x to the 5 thirds minus x to the 2 thirds. So f prime at x is equal to 5 over 3 x to the 2 over 3 and then minus 2 over 3 subtract 1, or 3 over 3, and that's negative 1 over 3. So f prime at x is equal to 5 over 3 x to the 2 thirds minus 2 over 3 x to the 1 third. And to get the critical numbers, we need to look at this and see if uh, where this derivative is equal to 0. First off, and then where it doesn't exist. So f prime at x is equal to 0. So 0. Now, this is where things get interesting. When we look at this, this uh, function the way it is, we should put it into form with a common denominator. Just to make the analysis easier, and also, the, in this case, the algebra is probably easier as well. But it will, when we do the interval analysis, we want to have a numerator and a denominator. So the common denominator is 3x to the 1 third, and then this is minus 2. And then 5x to the 2 thirds, we multiply by x to the 1 third, top and bottom. And x to the 2 thirds sums x to the 1 third is x plain x. And now when we set this to 0, we concern ourselves with the numerator only 
So 0 is equal to 5x minus 2. I'm going to get the answer immediately. 2 over divided by 5, so 2 fifths. And then the other type of critical number, if there is one, is where f prime at x doesn't exist. So this would be where the denominator is equal to 0. So 0 is equal to 3x to the 1 third. Divide by 3, cube everything, x is equal to 0. So here is what we have for the first derivative in this form. 5x minus 2 over 3x to the 1 third. Do the analysis on it. So we have 5x minus 2 for the 1 factor. 3x to the 1 third for the second factor, f prime at x for the other factor. Mark off where the critical numbers are. So there's 0, and then there's 2 over 5. So 5x minus 2, no big surprise is there. If x is bigger than 2 fifths, it's going to be positive. That factor will be positive. If it's less, it'll be negative. 3x to the 1 third, of course the 3 is not really necessary, really you just need the x, but it is the cube root of that number, so if you take the cube root of a positive number, you get a positive number. Take the cube root of a negative number, you get a negative. So the derivative is positive, the negative is positive. So we go up, we go down, we go up. So this indicates that there is a max, a local max, at x is equal to 0. Now we find out what the corresponding y value is. We already know based on this calculation. Um, we saw this earlier when we were getting the intercept. So f at 0 is equal to 0. So the max is going to be at x equals 0, 0, comma 0 with a max right there. And then we do the, we find the other the uh, minimum value by getting f at 2 over 5. A little tight for space here. But plug in 2 over 5. And this is one where I would deem it to be appropriate to round off the number just because that is not going to be a much um, easy to get an exact value. We could. It's just that we would be leaving it in that pretty much that form of 2 fifths to the 5 thirds minus 2 fifths to the 2 thirds. You can clean it up a little bit, but there's not that much you can do. So 2 fifths is um, 0.4. So I'm going to go 0.4 to the exponent of 5 thirds minus 0.4 to the exponent of 2 divided by 3. And we get negative 0.33 according to my calculation. So I will say just that. Negative 0.33. So it's not perfect, but we have, I'll decimalize the first point, 0.4 and then negative 0.3. I think I wanted this one to the nearest tenth. I'll just quickly check. Yep. Okay. So this would represent a minimum value. So we've got the first derivative analysis done. Let's now take a look at the second derivative analysis. So in fact, I'm going to title this page first, Derivative Analysis. Now your second derivative analysis oops, now to take the second derivative, we have a choice because we had the first derivative written in a couple of forms. Now, the fractional form that we had was fine um, when we for doing the interval analysis, but you will in fact find it easier to work with the, the original one we had, 5 thirds x to the 2 thirds minus 2 thirds x to the negative 1 thirds, third. 
So I'm going to write it like that. It may seem like we're going backwards, but it will help. So x to the 2 thirds, and then minus 2 thirds x to the negative 1 third. Just easier to differentiate. So we take the second derivative, multiply this one out. 5 thirds times 2 thirds is 10 over 9, and then x to the negative 1 third, and then plus um, 2 thirds times 1 third, the, uh, the, times the negatives become positive when you multiply them, it gives you 2 over 9, and then that's x to the negative 4 thirds. And once again, I get a common denominator. So we can do this in a couple of steps, but it's 10 over 9 x to the 1 third plus 2 over 9 x to the 4 thirds. Now it, I'm getting a common denominator, but it is possible to factor out a negative x, which is what some people do, and then put it in the right form. So it's really a, a judgment call on these. Both work the same way. And f double prime at x is equal to, with that denominator, we take a 9 on the bottom, and then x to the 4 thirds would be the um, x factor. And then, on the numerator, this 10 would stay the same, but we have to multiply by x to the 3 over 3. So that's how we get the denominator of 4 over 3. So 10 times x to the 3 over 3 is just 10x. And then the second one is we're all set up. It's 10x plus 2. Now the, the um, potential points of inflection we get when we set this to 0 first off. So 0 is equal to 10x plus 2 over 9x to the 4 over 3. Deal with that numerator. So 0 is equal to 10x plus 2. 10x is equal to negative 2, so x is equal to negative 1 over 5. Of course, you could have factored a 2 out when you had it set to 0 as well, would, um, or even the original derivative wouldn't have mattered. The next possible point of an inflection is where the second derivative doesn't exist. And this will be where your denominator, 9x to the 4 thirds, is equal to 0. Now this will give you x is equal to 0. So we can treat this as a potential point of inflection, although you're probably already thinking that there may be a problem with it. Um, but let's see where, where, it, uh, where it takes us. 9x to the 4 thirds, and then our second derivative down below. So 10x plus 2, potential point of inflection is at negative 1 over 5. 9x to the 4 thirds would be at 0. So 10x plus 2, if you picked a number bigger than negative 1 fifth, say even 0, it's going to be positive. That shouldn't be big, uh, big news. And then negative to the left. 9x to the 4 thirds is interesting because when you take the cube root of a number and then raise it to the fourth uh, power, it's always going to become positive. So in fact, this one is always, always, always going to be positive. And that means when we analyze this, that the, the function is negative there, it's positive there, and positive there. So it's negative, it's concave down. If it's positive, it's concave up, positive, concave up. So we, in fact, have a point of inflection at x is equal to negative 1 over 5. But it's not a point of inflection at x equals 0. That's because this function did not change concavity at that point. It also is because we had identified that point x equals 0 earlier as being a, I believe, a local min, or a, excuse me, a local max. And it cannot be both a max and a point of inflection. So um, for us, we can, um, you know, we could have recognized that earlier. And if you do find out what f at negative 1 over 5 is, plug it into the original. And here, too, I think is a good opportunity to decimalize it and uh, to the nearest tenth. So into the original, make sure. So negative 1 fifth 
raised to the exponent of 5 thirds minus negative 1 fifth to the exponent of 2 thirds. And I'm getting negative 0.41. So, we have everything we need. Negative 1 over 5 comma negative 0.41. So what was missing in the lesson, um, previous lesson was graphing it. We did look at the graph, but that was too easy. So now let's, um, let's actually take the information we have and put it on a graph and, and then um, eventually compare it to the real graph. So we look at this and we see that we first off have all real numbers for the domain, but we have x-intercepts at 0, 0, and then 1, 0. We have a y-intercept of 0, 0 as well. We then look at the graph and we have a maximum at 0, 0, and a minimum of 1, 0. Now the minimum is occurring at 2 fifths, which is 0.4, and um, or let's see, let me back this one up, just try to read my own here. Um, okay, so let me, okay, so the maximum is at zero, zero. Okay, right there, I'm, I'm with it, I got it now. And then at 0.4, two fifths, and the y intercept is at negative 0.33. Three. So that's about right, that's 0.2, 0.4, say about right there. So that's a min. Now we want to be aware too that the max at x equals 0 is going to be a cusp. We know it's going to be a cusp because that's, we found that critical number where the derivative did not exist on the denominator. And we also know that the graph is increasing until it gets to this point. So it's going to be increasing. We also know that the graph is concave its concavity changes. Now I'm just going to draw in this section around zero first off. But it's going to be a cusp-like, a little sharp, and then it's going to be sharp there. And then it has a smooth turn at that x equal two-fifths, which I'll label in afterwards. And then it has its the x-intercept at one. Now in terms of concavity, we see that it has a, it's concave down until negative one-fifth, and then it's concave up from negative one-fifth to zero. So I may have overshot it a little bit, but it's going to, at this point there, it's going to be concave up, and then it's going to go off there and be concave down for the rest of the trip. It's concave up all the way until it zero, and then it's also concave up from zero everywhere else. So this graph is going to continue to be concave up like that. So at this point, the min will be um, two over five, or point four, comma negative point three, and then this point is zero, zero. We have a point of inflection, which I will label. Now, I don't expect you to label these ones perfectly just because the, you know, it really does clutter up the graph a bit. But, um, and we do have it indicated otherwise earlier. But the point of inflection is negative 1 over 5, and I believe the, the um, negative 0.4 for the y-coordinate. And then the other point of inflection that we've got, well, that's the only point of inflection we've got. So we can do a pretty good job of getting the graph. It's hard, particularly with the concavity issues, to get it perfect, but uh, that's not bad. And then I'm going to take a quick look at the graph at the later on, because I do have this one convenient. So this is what I, I graphed myself. And if you graph it on the calculator, you'll get something kind of like that. But you can, you can see it. This graph is a little tough to tell where the point of inflection is there, I think, because it's uh, the scale is such. Here's negative 1 and negative one there, so it, it's, it's really hard to tell. But, and so in fact, we did a 
better job by graphing it by hand in a lot of ways. Now let's take a look at this one and um, then I think that's going to probably do it for us. Now we, we can do a few things with this one with respect to the, um, the derivatives but let's quickly get the domain worked out and then the asymptotes and etc like that. Now the domain is um, everything except for zero So if you wrote that in interval notation, negative infinity to zero in union with zero to positive infinity. So x cannot be equal to zero on the denominator. As far as the intercepts go, well the y-intercept, we set x equal to zero and we get f at zero is equal to 0 minus 4. Look at this over 0 squared. Well, of course, we can tell x cannot be equal to 0 anyway, so there's no y-intercept. Then your x-intercept, or seps, we set y equal to 0. So this function can only be equal to 0 when the numerator is equal to 0, so we get x equal 4. So we do have an x-intercept. Take a look at um, any asymptotes. So a vertical asymptote, we already know that x is equal to 0, because of the denominator not equal to that. Then your horizontal asymptote, if you take the limit of this function as x gets larger or smaller without bound. Now this one you can cheat a little bit, um, because the denominator has a higher exponent. Um, the denominator is going to be increasing very rapidly. And then you want to be seeing, well, well, what effect is that going to have on the, as a numerator? And um, in fact, it's going to be equal to zero. Now, if you want to actually do the work by simplifying dividing by x to the 2, you'd get 1 over x minus 4 over x2 all over 1. So we would be taking the limit. And it's possible in this case, when we stop here, we can see that we can go plus or minus in the same step because we're just going to get equal, equal to 0 on the top. So therefore, there is a horizontal asymptote at y is equal to 0. Interesting. Now the symmetries might also be interesting. Let's see if we can do anything with this f at negative x is equal to negative x minus 4 over negative x squared. Now that denominator is going to be x squared because the negative squared is positive and then we get a negative, factor out a negative and that would give you x plus 4. So the question is, does this have any um, does this have any any um, symmetries based on this? Well, answer would be no, because this one does not equal to f at x. It's not equal to the original. Neither is it equal to negative f at x. So once again, had this been x minus 4, it would have been OK. It would have been identical. So therefore, there are no symmetries. So the next step is to go after the derivatives. Now the derivatives themselves are interesting because um, with this function x minus 4 over x squared, we could do a few things with it. x minus 4 over x squared. You could certainly use the quotient rule, but you might find it makes sense to write it like this. By dividing each term by x squared, this is x over x squared, because you only have a single term denominator, minus 4 over x squared. f at x could be written then as x to the negative 1 
minus 4x to the negative 2. And that would mean that the first derivative is equal to negative x to the negative 2 plus 8x to the negative 3. So f prime at x is equal to negative and then 1 over x squared plus 8 over x cubed. So it's kind of an interesting one because now we've got to um, write this one with a common denominator. Had we used the quotient rule it would already have been in that form. And the common denominator will be x to the 3 because we can turn x2 into x to the 3 through multiplication by multiplying by x to the 1 x to the 1 times x to the 2 is x to the 3. x times negative 1 is negative x plus 8. So f prime at x, doesn't matter which order you write it, but I'll go 8 minus x over x cubed. And then to get the critical numbers, f prime at x is equal to 0. This will occur where the numerator 8 minus x is equal to 0, so x equal 8. And then where f prime at x doesn't exist, here we get where x cubed, denominator is equal to 0, x equals 0, this is outside the domain. x is not allowed to be 0. So I'm just going to title this first derivative analysis. So we have 8 minus x is our one factor, x cubed, and then f prime at x. Now the reason I'm putting the zero there is um, it is outside the domain, of course, so it is not a critical number, but it is a good idea to label the asymptotes anyways just to see if anything unusual is happening with this one at that point. Now 8 minus x, if you picked an x value that was bigger than um, 8, say 10, 8 minus 10 is negative, so it's negative to the right, positive to the left, and then x cubed, if it's greater than 0, it's positive, if it's less than 0, it's negative. So the first derivative is negative there, positive there, negative there. So the graph is decreasing, it's increasing, and then it's decreasing again. So the reason this graph is um, interesting is based on this. You might mistakenly think that zero is a, is a um, turning point, but it isn't because it doesn't exist. So not a turning point. However, the direction does change from the left of 0 to the right of 0. And then we have a local max at x equal 8. So we go back into the original, just going to take this down below, get a little space, and find out what f at 8 is equal to. And that's 8 minus 4 over 8 squared. So 4 over 64, f at 8, according to my calculations, is going to be 1 over 16. So we make a little note. There is a maximum value. When x is 8, y is equal to 1 over 16. Now I think that you're going to enjoy this graph quite a bit. It's got some things going on that are a little unusual. Now the second derivative analysis. If you take a look at our first derivative in its simplest form, we had negative x to the negative 2 
and then plus 8x to the negative 3. So it'll be easier to differentiate this expression. So the second derivative would be equal to positive 2 and then x to the negative 3 minus 24 x to the negative 4. So then expressing that with positive exponents is 2 over x cubed minus 24 over x to the 4. I would advise you to express this now with a common denominator or to have taken out a factor of x to the negative 4, which works nicely too. This is x to the 4. Um, so we have to multiply this one by x and this one by x. So that becomes 2x minus 24. So the second derivative at uh, would be 2x minus 24. Just to keep things interesting, I'm going to factor out a 2, but that goes nowhere. And then when you take a look at the possible points of inflection occurring where this is equal to 0, so that's where the numerator is equal to 0. So if you bring the 2 over and add 12, I'll go directly there, x is 12. And then f double prime at x is equal to, or doesn't exist. Here we would say that uh, no potential points of inflection. x to the 4 equal to 0. If you can read that, I barely can. x to the 4 equal to 0 will just produce 0 again. Okay, now I am going to mark that off because that is an asymptote. So there's some interesting things happening there, perhaps. But um, I'm more concerned with the x minus 12. So I'm just going to write this as x minus 12. The 2 doesn't make any difference. It's a positive number, so you can write it or not. And then 12 is that potential point of inflection. So the graph is po uh, the factor is positive to the left or to the right of 12, negative to the left. And then x to the 4 is going to be positive everywhere because it's um, raised to the fourth power. So we're negative there, we're negative there, we're positive. So this means it's concave down, concave down, concave up. And it therefore means that there's a point of inflection at x is equal to 12. Now when we try to find that point, f at 12 into the original, if you can remember what that is after all this time, it'd be 12 minus 4 over 12 squared. So you work that one out, 12 minus 4 is 8 of course, 8 over 144, and we can fractionalize this 1 over 18. So we've got it all. Now to graph this, we can note our intercepts which were at 4 comma 0 just barely uh, barely have this one so this graph's going to get choked off a little bit but i think we'll uh, i wish i'd done a better job of showing that too late now um, but oh well we have an asymptote at x equals 0 and we have our maximum value is at 8 so that actually is going to be this is unfortunate because the graph is over there um, and we have a horizontal asymptote of 0, y equals 0. Now the graph is therefore going to be going like this for that interval to the 
the left of the x-axis. So that one works out pretty well. Now you'll notice that based on what we have from the information, that it is concave down all the way to zero, and that makes sense because it's clearly concave down, and also that the function is decreasing in that interval. So it has to be going down. So we know that we're going to have to be down in that quadrant. And then on the other side, the function is increasing from 0 to 8. Crossing at 4, reaching its maximum, and then it comes back down again. So its maximum is going to occur when x is 8, and y, um, what did we say that was going to be 1 over, just check that one, 16, I guess. So it just barely goes above the axis for its max. And then with in terms of concavity, this graph is going to be concave down again until it gets to 12. So it's concave down. So I didn't do a great job getting through the axis, maybe more like that. It's great to have these graphing calculators for that reason. We can't see what happens over there. Um, I will clean up this graph for future generations, but the point of inflection is going to be at 12 comma, and uh, what did we say that that one was? 1 over 18. So let's take a look at this graph where it's really drawn well with a graphing utility, and then you get this. Now this isn't perfect either, but you can see that the graph actually, strangely enough, does go across the x-axis, reaches its max at 8, and then goes back down again towards the x-axis, never crosses it again. So this graph is not perfectly symmetric about the y-axis. It's not an even graph. So it crept over the x-axis at x equal 4, went just a little bit up because its maximum value is only like 1 16th. So 8 comma 1 over 16. It was concave down in all this region, but then once it started to flatten out a bit, then its point of inflection there at, one, at um, 12 comma 1 over 18, and then it started to be concave up at that point. So an interesting graph. So that's going to take care of just the raw sketching. The only remaining lesson is going to be on oblique asymptotes, which are kind of a specialty thing. But uh, these are four basic graphs that you could run into. And everything else works into the same principles. Just algebraically, you may run into some you know, issues. So thank you for your time.